The race for a sea route to the Indies was won by the Portuguese when Vasco da Gama returned from India in September 1499, having sailed around Africa. Columbus, on the other hand, had little to show for his half a decade rule as the governor of his so-called Indies. The Spanish monarchs were forced to constantly invest more money and effort in colonizing the newly found lands, with little return and no viable route to the real Indies. Columbus now stood on trial for accusations of mismanagement, enslavement, and rebellion against the monarchy. Here is an excerpt of what Columbus wrote in his own defense. I have placed under their sovereignty more land than there is in Africa and Europe, and more than 1700 islands. In seven years, I, by the divine will, made that conquest. At a time when I was entitled to expect rewards and retirement, I was incontinently arrested and sent home loaded with chains. The accusation was brought out of malice on the basis of charges made by civilians who had revolted and wished to take possession on the land. I beg your graces, with the zeal of faithful Christians in whom their highnesses have confidence, to read all my papers and to consider how I, who came from so far to serve these princes, now at the end of my days, have been despoiled of my honor and my property without cause, wherein is neither justice nor mercy. King Ferdinand II and Queen Isabella summoned Columbus and his brothers to the Alhambra Palace in Grenada, where he admitted to his faults and begged for forgiveness from the monarchs. They took pity on him and ordered him and his brothers to be freed. However, he would be stripped of his title of Governor of the Indies, and Nicolas de Ovando was named the new governor. On September 27, 1501, Bobadilla was ordered by royal mandate to return Columbus's possessions. This legal reprieve, though, did not dampen his ambitions. Still convinced that there is a western route to Asia, Columbus lobbied the sovereigns to fund one last voyage to India. The monarchs reluctantly agreed but wanted to avoid any potential conflicts in authority if Columbus is allowed back on Hispaniola. So they stipulated that Columbus must steer clear of Hispaniola and instead focus only on finding the westward passage to the Indies. The mission of this voyage was to find the Strait of Malacca and finally establish the long-promised trading route to India. Columbus agreed to this condition and on March 14, 1502, sailed with four ships and 147 men from the port of Cadiz. His first stop on his last voyage was to Arzilla on the Moroccan coast, where he went to rescue Portuguese soldiers who were besieged by the Moors. From here, the Atlantic trade winds allowed him to cross the ocean in 20 days, leading him to land on the island of Martinique on June 15. For the next few days, Columbus sailed once again along the islands of the Lesser Antilles until, based on the weather conditions, he anticipated that a hurricane was brewing. His only viable refuge being Hispaniola, he charted a course to the island despite having explicit instructions not to land there. He arrived at Santo Domingo on June 29th, but as per royal decree, was denied port. Meanwhile, the new governor of Hispaniola, Nicolas de Ovando, was planning to send a large fleet of 20 ships back to Spain along with Francisco de Bobadilla. These ships bore treasures and gold that were taken from the islands, including Columbus's share of the gold, based on the arrangement he had with the monarchs. Columbus warned them about the impending hurricane, but Ovando refused to believe him and sent the fleet into the sea. Almost the entire fleet, including the ship with Bobadilla on board, was lost to the storm. Columbus was able to shelter his ships in a nearby estuary, protecting them from the hurricane. As luck would have it, the only ship that made it back to Spain from the fleet sent by Orlando was the one carrying Columbus's share of gold. Once the hurricane subsided, Columbus sailed with his crew to Jamaica and then on to the southwest coast of Cuba to replenish their stocks before continuing their mission of exploration. On July 30th, 1502, he arrived on the island of Guanaja, off the coast of Honduras. Here they encountered friendly natives who introduced them for the first time to the cacao plant, which forms the basis of chocolate. Columbus recounts a native elder described to him seeing people with swords and horses. For some reason, this convinced Columbus that he was less than a 10-day journey to the river Ganga. Yes, that Ganga. On August 14th, Columbus landed on the mainland in what is present-day Honduras. He spent two months sailing south along this coast looking for the opening that would be his Strait of Malacca before arriving at Almirante Bay in Panama on October 16th. 
Here the natives informed them of another ocean that was just a 10 day march down south. This convinced Columbus that he was very close to the Strait of Malacca and set up a garrison on the mouth of the Belen River in January 1503. Yet over the next four months, Columbus and his crew were not able to find this other ocean. Instead, they searched the nearby land for gold and valuables, leading them to become increasingly adversarial with the natives and causing attacks on his ships. This includes a large attack on April 6th, which caused Columbus to abandon one of his ships due to damage. With the three remaining ships, he sailed from Panama, intending to stop at Hispaniola before sailing back to Spain. On May 10th, he sighted the Cayman Islands and named one of them Las Tortugas on account of the numerous turtles on the shores. His ships once again encountered a great storm off the coast of Cuba. They made it as far as Jamaica before all the ships had to be beached on June 25th, 1503. Here, Columbus and his crew remained stranded for almost a year. A Spanish sailor and his crew named Diego Mendez paddled a canoe along with some natives to seek help from Hispaniola. However, Hispaniola's governor, Nicolas de Ovando, refused to help Columbus based on the royal decree banning him from the island. Diego Mendez pleaded with the governor for months and each time his request was denied. Finally, on June 29, 1504, Nicolas de Ovando agreed to help Columbus and sent a caravel for him and his crew. Of the 147 that sailed from Spain with Columbus, only 110 survived to board this caravel. Due to strong opposing winds, it took another 45 days for this caravel to reach Hispaniola. 38 of the 110 on board the caravel decided to stay back on Hispaniola. The remaining men, along with Columbus, departed on September 11, 1504. They reached San Lucar on November 7, 1504, culminating the fourth and final journey of Columbus to the Americas. Following his return to Spain, Columbus spent the remainder of his life appealing to King Ferdinand II to regain his lost titles. While his titles of Viceroy and Governor were not restored, Ferdinand agreed to give him 2% of the riches from the so-called Indies, which was a substantial sum, allowing his sons a lifestyle of nobility. A year after he returned from the Americas for the final time, Columbus became severely ill, possibly due to Reiter's syndrome, which causes arthritis along with eye and urinary tract disorders. On May 20th, 1506, he passed away at the age of 56, leaving a legacy of exploration, ambition, as well as pillaging and ruthlessness. Till his dying breath, however, and having spent nearly 10 years on the islands, he was completely convinced that he was within touching distance of Asia, despite being half a world away.